Welcome to our quarterly Global Health Compassion Rounds, which is being jointly convened by the World Health Organization's Global Learning Laboratory for Quality Universal Health Coverage in Geneva, and the focus area for compassion and ethics, FACE, at the Task Force for Global Health in Atlanta. The purpose of these rounds is to share experiences, challenge ideas, and spark thinking on compassion in global health. My name is David Addis, and along with my colleague, Dr. Sham Syed, we're excited to be hosting this event. We have a terrific group of panelists and discussants for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. The theme of our rounds today is compassionate leadership. You may say, well, why compassionate leadership? We now have randomized clinical trials that document the benefits of compassion training for individuals but we struggle to develop and sustain compassionate organizations. As you'll hear today, leadership is crucial for compassionate organizations. In my conversations with global health leaders over the last several years, uh, they've described three challenges to compassion in their work. The first is compassion at a distance. In global health, we often work at great distances from the people whose health we're working to improve. We see the numbers and the populations rather than the individuals and faces. Second, there is a barrier of what I call compulsion to save the world, an over-identification with work, um, a preoccupation with metrics and measures and outcomes to the neglect of relationships, process, and compassion. And third, there's a conspiracy of silence so many people in global health are motivated by a sense of compassion, but for some reason, we don't feel comfortable sharing this with each other. So the power of this collective energy, this collective motivation is hidden. One objective of these global health compassion rounds is to break this conspiracy of silence. We will have time for questions and conversation uh, during the a webinar, but also especially at the end. So I encourage you, if you have questions, to enter them into the Q&A box. If you have comments, please feel free to enter them in the chat room, and we'll try to get to them. I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Sham Syed, now for additional remarks to set the stage for our time together today. Shams? Thank you very much, David, uh, and thank you for that important framing. Greetings to everybody. I'm really delighted that we're exploring the role and value of compassionate leadership in global health settings. And it's an urgent exploration given the huge challenges that face healthcare today in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in tackling a diverse set of urgent issues that face health systems and societies across the world. So, Leadership counts and it counts at all levels. And we know also that compassion in its truest form can catalyze unimaginable leadership behaviors. And we've seen that throughout human history. Coming to today and coming to the issue of quality of care, our Director General, Dr. Tedros, highlighted back in 2018 when three seminal global reports were published on quality of care, a few words that certainly remain poignant to this day. And he told us, quality is not a given. It takes vision, planning, investment, compassion, meticulous execution, and rigorous monitoring from the national level to the smallest, remotest clinic. And all of that happens through leadership. Three points to emphasize. First, the compassion equation, and the experts on compassion are with us today, empathy plus action can influence leaders at all levels to drive quality healthcare. And what are the levels I'm talking about? I'm talking about the point of care, I'm talking about leading teams, that deliver that care, both clinical and non-clinical members of that team, leading the organization of quality care for local populations, leading national strategic direction and quality of care, and leading cross-country endeavors to drive 
quality of care improvements across the world. And let's imagine what all of that leadership would look like if compassion uh, was injected into it. Second point, all domains of quality health services, clinical effectiveness, patient safety, people-centeredness, timeliness, equity, efficiency, and integration are affected and linked to this compassion equation. So leadership counts for each of those domains, and importantly, the interdependence of all of those domains, the culture of quality in a health setting, the glue that holds things together in any healthcare environment. Lastly, let's take inspiration from the leader of all leaders on quality, the late Avidis Donabedian, who many of you will know, a physician and founder of the study of quality in healthcare, most famously as a creator of the Donabedian model of care, which stands true today. His personal philosophy, and I turn to his personal philosophy deliberately, is perhaps best summed up in his statement, and I quote, systems awareness and systems design are important for health professionals, but are not enough. They are enabling mechanisms. It is the ethical dimension of individuals that is essential to a system's success. Ultimately, the secret of quality is love. Repeat the last sentence, the secret of quality is Let me end there as I'm eager to hear and learn from the amazing panelists today, and they are really amazing. Let's remind ourselves what David had actually mentioned. You're going to share thinking, challenge each other, and spark new thinking in a very open way. What emerges from the Global Fashion Round can certainly inform us all. So we really need to think, and we really, really need to learn from each other, particularly for those that we serve particularly those that are unheard and unseen across the world. Thank you again, David, and back to you. Thank you very much, Shams. And um, I too am just delighted to introduce our amazing panelists today. First, we have uh, Laura Berland and Evan Harrell from the Center for Compassionate Leadership. Laura is the founder and executive director of the center and she has a rich experience in serial, as a serial tech entrepreneur, a Fortune 500 executive, a meditation teacher, transformational facilitator, executive coach, and digital media creator, just to name a few. Evan Harrell is the chief operating officer of the Center for Contemplative Leadership. And he's worked also in a very diverse fields in nonprofit sector, uh, basically um, directing a group of inner city schools, preschools in Houston, and as an investment manager of a large equity mutual fund. So welcome to, to both of you. Dr. Monica Warline is an organizational psychologist and author of the book, Awakening Compassion at Work. She's a core faculty member at the University of Michigan Center for Positive Organizations and a research scientist at Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, known as CARE. She co-founded the Idea Incubator and Liven Work, which is dedicated to bringing humanity's curiosity, compassion, and courageous thinking to life. Welcome, Monica. It's delightful to have both all of you here. We're just thrilled to have you. Before we begin with our panel, which will be moderated by Shams, I'd like to invite Laura to lead us in a brief centering practice. Mm. Laura. Thank you so much, David and Shams. And hello, compassionate friends. Wow, it is such a gift to be here with all of you today from all corners of the globe. And what an amazing time this is that we get to connect like this and to put our minds and our hearts and our intentions together for a more compassionate world. Let's just spend a couple of minutes together in reflection. So I invite you to put everything to one side, to quiet the swirl of the day, let the busyness go and slow it all down. We slow it down to give our nervous systems a moment to settle, 
to calm and to take a much needed rest. In this stillness, in the quiet, let's think about bringing the many parts of ourselves back home, back home to that base in your body, back home to yourself because it's incredible that we spend all day caring for others, working, sharing our energy outward. And now we can take this time to bring our attention home. So we create space and give ourselves permission to rest, to restore, to listen, and to receive. We all recognize this has been the most extraordinary year of pain and suffering, tremendous grief and sadness. Along with that, so much overwhelm and burnout and frustration. And yet we carry on with courage, with resilience, and we look to find joy and as Shams quoted love and laughter. So let's take this time to turn our care and our kindness inward to make ourselves sustainable in the slow, quiet stillness mm -hmm. and to nurture that inner compassion that is innately in all of us. Taking these last few seconds in silence We can remember, we can rest, and we can restore. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you for all the compassionate work that you do in the world. Onward, onward to Shins. Thank you very much, Laura. We filled us down. We could have a focused conversation for sure. Thank you very much. We can move into the next phase of our Global Health Compassion Rounds. Um, before we do that, I'd just like to introduce also, you can see uh, Zero, my colleague Zerahun Tades also with us. Um, and we will come to uh, an intervention from, from Zerahun following this initial uh, phase of the Global Health Compassion Rounds when I'll introduce him. Um, let's turn to the slides, if we may, and this next session, the 30 minutes that we have on this particular part of the Global Health Compassion Round, we'll first hear some introductory remarks from our panelists, and they're short, they're sharp, um, and we can really try to bring that to our consciousness. We'll then have 15 minutes of uh, a discussion with the panelists. So, over to you now to take us forward, Monica. Thank you so much, Shams, David, Heather, Evan, Laura, Zarahun, for the invitation to be with you today. It's really an honor. I'm going to speak really briefly about how we might see compassion through the lens of social science and why seeing it that way is so important for this conversation. So when I speak to leaders about things that I know they care about, I talk about five reasons that compassion belongs on any leader's strategic agenda. Of course, you all are in a deep conversation about quality and care. And there's plenty of evidence to show that when people feel that they work in a compassionate environment, service and care quality goes up. But as a leader, you're also working toward innovation and bringing people together to share ideas safely and well so that you can create the next phase of growth in your world. And you can't do that without compassion. You're bringing together people across multiple domains of expertise to try to help facilitate that growth and conversation and change in the field. And that cannot happen without compassion. You have 
um, multitudes of people looking to you for how to engage and go forward, looking to you for care and advice about how to take the work into the world. And they cannot engage highly and well without feeling that they work in a compassionate environment. And you have to keep those people who are so essential to the work. And we can't keep people in demanding work environments unless we treat them with care. So whatever part of your street strategic agenda is most important to you now, please understand that there is a lot of evidence across the disciplines of the social sciences to argue that these five things really change when you lead with compassion. And I hope you can hear how passionate I am about teaching about this all around the world because the quality of people's lives depends on the quality of how they work in this kind of caring environment or not. As David said, we are really dedicated to our work, maybe over dedicated to our work, to our detriment at times but it is a life or death conversation for people to talk about the quality of their work environment. So let me breathe and ask that we move on to say, all right, Monica, I believe you. You convinced me it should be on my strategic agenda. So what the heck are you talking about? Right? When I'm talking about compassion, from my perspective as an organizational scholar, I'm looking at it as a social process that involves many people. And it also involves something that is unfolding over time. It's depicted as a process diagram on this screen to help you see that this is a quite complex process in your organization that needs to be managed and led and understood just as any other process would. And where, everywhere that you see an arrow in this diagram, the process can break. Every arrow can break, which is why we so often um, are moved individually to feel concern for other people, but our institutions and organizations don't respond the way we wish they would. So I'm going to go very rapidly through each of the parts of this diagram, and I'm just going to call attention as I do to one important facet. Now, there's much to learn and study here. I've spent 25 years understanding this diagram, so obviously this is going to be a very quick tour. But first, I want to um, anchor in on compassion as different from kindness or other kinds of positive emotions because compassion always unfolds in relationship to pain and there are common forms of pain that arise in our organizations all the time there are distinctive forms of pain that arise in your work and evan and laura are going to talk a bit more about distinctive forms of pain that you're working with all the time but we're always in a dialogue with pain when we're talking about compassion. And as pain surfaces in our organizations, the most important thing we can do, and the next step in defining compassion is that we have to notice that it's there. And um, the a poet that I love, McClatchy, says that attention is the quality of love that we give to something, right? how we give attention to the pain and suffering in our organizations will determine whether compassion can unfold or not. And so most times in complex organizations, compassion stops simply because we don't even notice it's there. We stop paying attention. Once we notice that it's there, we must interpret suffering and pain in work as worthy of our attention and worthy of our concern and action. And we're storytelling creatures. So if you're not telling yourself the story as a leader, that you, suffering and pain is part of what you must pay attention to, right? then you won't be open and ready to interpret that suffering as something you must act upon. So we notice, we interpret, 
And then we feel something in relation to this pain and suffering around us. The feeling that's most helpful to cultivate as a leader is concern for the well being of others. And that concern, when we can feel empathic concern for others, moves us to act almost automatically. And the science is showing us more and more that that move to action is rapid and the action can be small and targeted or it can be grand and elaborated. Um, and we can become far more skillful at acting with compassion. And that means that, of course, we can learn to be better, more skillful leaders who unlock this compassion process in our organization. Thank you, Sharon. One, that's wonderful, Monica. Sorry, I was just on mute for a second there. Um, 55 years on one slide. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot to digest from that 25 years. <laughs> Onwards, uh, let's turn now to the next intervention, please. I uh, thank you, Monica, for your wisdom, for your years of experience, and, and for sharing that. Um, that's very powerful. I want to ask something of a rhetorical question, which is, in the field of global health, where the entire purpose is to relieve suffering and seek to remove the causes of suffering, how is it that so many people in the field suffer themselves with big challenges such as burnout? To explore the question, let me start with a partial definition of compassionate leadership. Compassionate leadership has two parts. The first is treating those you lead with compassion in all circumstances, an individual compassion, how we act with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a second element to compassionate leadership, and that is creating a culture of compassion that supports the flourishing of everyone. This is the organizational compassion that is created by its leaders. To better understand compassionate leadership, we've been asking our recent cohorts of global health leaders, what is challenging them to lead more compassionately in both of these two dimensions? So in the first dimension, the personal challenges that have surfaced in global health in our surveys in becoming a more compassionate leader are first and second, a lack of boundaries, a trouble saying no, and perfectionism. As Monica said, I mean, it, quite frankly, it's ironic and tragic that our desire to help is so strong that it actually comes back and holds us back and makes it more difficult to, to act compassionately. The third personal challenge is a lack of self-compassion and you can't give what you don't have. So we need to focus on self-compassion in order to be able to lead others compassionately. And the final factor is a lack of knowledge about how to lead compassionately. And um, Monica's slides showed, for example, a, a number of uh, inhibitors and a number of promoters of compassion. And these are teachable leadership development skills. On the second dimension of compassion, which is the, the organizational dimension, we've asked, what are the external challenges you face in becoming a more compassionate leader? And number one, with over 70% of the survey participants, they said that excessive demands on my time and overwork are what are holding me back. This is a cultural element that we have the power to change if we choose. This is connected to the first two individual uh, in hip that we saw on the previous slide. Um, too many demands on my time. So we need an intentional effort on the part of leaders to focus on not having excessive demands on, my, on time. The second issue is the legacy of colonialism and systemic racism. And while I said that we have the choice to, to address that first one, I don't think that this is a choice. This must be addressed everywhere. And I think we would all agree that this is something that must be addressed. 
The third is what David spoke of, um, compassion at a distance. And this is something that just must be overcome in any global field. And finally, there's a lack of support, uh, emotional support in the workplace. This is another cultural element that can be addressed if we choose to, and we can choose. These are all issues that can be addressed through easily teachable skills. Let me now turn it to Laura. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Monica. You know, as, as I think the message has filtered out, even in the short period of time that we've been together today, leading with compassion starts from the inside out. We have a simple framework to help train and enable leaders to practice this as well as developing cultures of compassion. Next slide, please. The inner work in the center is what's necessary to be able to show up as a leader, to be able to be your own container for your own emotions and to model and embody compassion for those in your sphere of influence. Next, please. The middle ring, compassion in relationships, personal relationships, work relationships, communities. This is the work of organizational compassion and how we ripple our own compassion outward to include all of those we interact with and we're in relationship with. And I love that Monica shared the poem where our attention is shown as love because that's really what it takes. And lastly, please. Yeah, we're all focused in the same direction. It's almost as if we, we don't have as much work to do here because we're out there already doing the work of the greater good and giving our hearts to the, the work that needs to be done in the world. And last slide, Heather, please. This is really about locking arms so that we can support each other. We cannot do this alone. If we want to give compassion to ourselves and bring compassion out in the world for all, it's not a solo endeavor. We really must build communities of, of support, organizations that become cultures of compassion compassion that supports people's inner compassion and compassion that supports the outward flow of compassion everywhere the organization has um, influence in the world. And lastly, I would just like to say, this is about building cultures of safety, of connection and belonging so that we can trust each other, so that we respect each other, and so that we have a sense of equality and equity for all the people that we touch. Thank you, Shams, back to you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Evan, and thank you, Monica. We'll come back to some of these key takeaways, perhaps, but for now, let's go back some of the questions that may be evolving from the points that have been made. I'd like to turn to uh, some pragmatic aspects of um, compassionate leadership. So, uh, many of the colleagues on the, on the compassion rounds today are under extreme pressure, um, whether that's at the front line of clinical care or whether that's leadership roles in public health, whether that be leadership roles in wider arenas. Um, what would you say to those, and I turn to Monica first in the first instance, what would you say to those that say, well, compassion, it sounds great, and you can't argue with it conceptually, but practically wouldn't go for that because we're just, there's too many things to tackle in the immediate. Monica, what would you say to that? 
I think that's how we got ourselves into this mess, Shams. <laughs> the over focus on technical expertise and technical excellence with the mindset that it's either that or care is a part of how we have sculpted organizations that come to embrace care but not practice it. They practice technical excellence and they talk about care. And this is not an either or. And a part of what we know how to do as leaders as we become more skilled in this area is to unlock resources for multiple parts of our agenda and to make them work together. So when I say that compassion is our strategic concern, it means that we cannot actually have innovation in our organizations or quality of care without having compassion. They have to be woven back together. And we have to think of the social architectures of our organizations as doing the work of unlocking compassion, just as importantly, just as centrally as they're doing the work of surgery or anesthesiology or vaccination. Right? And this is, how, this is compassionate leadership. It's not something separate from the, ever, the rest of the work that leaders do. Oh. Great. Thank you, Monica, for bringing that very clear message. Uh, Laura Evans, same question. What, what are your thoughts? Well, it's hard to, uh, to say more than what Monica said, because what she said is so powerful. What I, wa what I want to say is that compassion is hard work. It requires courage. And the reason that we, we have gotten into this, this mess, is, as Monica states it, is because what compassion requires is speaking up about how we can be doing things. And in an institutional setting, oftentimes many people probably would agree with the steps that need to be taken. But it's a challenge to take the courage to say, why are we having this two hour meeting every week when it's not really achieving anything? There, there's the, this, this conspiracy of silence, if you will, that we won't address these issues that are affecting us on an emotional level for fear of feeling weak. And yet everyone else is feeling the same thing. And so if one person, ideally the leader, will speak up, it begins to ripple out mm -hmm. and everyone acknowledges all of the same challenges. And we can do, as Laura said, lock arm in arm to begin to address it. Feel like we're supporting each other, not undermining or competing with each other. You know, Shams, if I might to get very briefly give a very concrete example. One thing I find in teaching about this is that the rhetoric can get very lofty and people have a hard time bringing it back to what does it mean about my daily life? And um, one thing we've been working on recently is un in one health system where we work um, in a design process, the nurses um, and uh, lower level caregivers in the hierarchy of the organization told us that the shift change was the worst moment of their day. And we really took the effort to understand why is that? And then to help them re-infuse a tiny bit more humanity and more compassion for themselves and their colleagues into the way they engage in the shift change, which might be 15 minutes or less of their day. And by working with a routine that you would manage if you're managing safety and managing it with also compassion in mind, right? Not doing the either or, but putting it back together, we were able to keep or increase safety outcomes at the same time that we dramatically increased caregiver quality of life measures. Great example, Monica. And I think a previous compassion round, and maybe we can put this in the chat box, the previous compassion round has looked at specific examples of how compassion can affect clinical care. I'm gonna to come to another question that for me is really fundamental. In order to redesign uh, systems 
And I think everybody's hinting at that, not hinting, directly stating that that's required. Question, can compassionate leadership be taught? And if so, how can it be taught? Uh, Monica, should we start with you? Well, my answer is absolutely yes. And thank goodness that Laura and Evan are here to tell us how that's exactly what they're doing. But I want to just make one tiny distinction in the question, if I could, which is, uh, I think of this in the title of my book, Awakening Compassion. Now, I'm not teaching anyone how to be compassionate, but right? what we're doing is awakening compassion that's already available to humanity and is there as a resource that we have, we have designed organizations and institutions that kill it or depress it or tell us it's not relevant or that it's not welcome. And so part of what we're learning when we're learning to be compassionate leaders is to reawaken our own compassion and to understand that um, all those obstacles that we have put up to block compassion can be removed. Right? So there's a lot to be learned here, just as there's a lot to be learned if you're studying finance or operations. Um, but it's not exactly learning to be compassionate. It's learning to reawaken and to design systems and organizations that can awaken compassion. So Monica, design principles that can be applied and in a very pragmatic and practical way to redesign systems, yeah? Yes. Super. Um, Laura and Evan, uh, I wanted to, for you to think that through that question, but also layer upon that the conspiracy of silence that David mentioned previously. How would you go about building the capacity for compassion at different levels in the midst of a conspiracy of silence? Yeah. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> and it can be done, as Monica said. And I just want to start by saying it not that any of this is so simple. But if we go back to the quote about turning our attention to love, it's about turning your attention. And that can happen in a moment, in a second, in a small break, in uh, larger forms of attention on an organizational level. But just starting on the inner work, it can be that fundamental as shifting our attention from being swept away by all the difficulty of the day and not recognizing reawaken. I love that you used reawakening, Monica, because it's about clearing away the stuff of modern life, of modern organizations, of modern stress and modern technology that have sort of, you know, enveloped us in this cycle of, frankly, insanity <laughs> that we all live with. And we just have to come back to that fundamental quiet place so that we have the ability to turn our attention to what matters. And what matters is this quality of love and giving ourselves permission to do that is everything and giving our organizations permission to do this and to focus in this way is exactly what we can do. And Shams, if, if I may just add one more brief thing, because I think that, that Monica's point about reawakening is very important. And when we consider it in the, in the format of systems change, we have to recognize that this is actually a bottoms up process. And there's, you know, there's a, I, I think it's a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale of the emperor's new clothes. One small boy said, why doesn't the emperor have any clothes on? W one person starting a meeting in a, in, a, in a supportive way, asking someone how they're doing today in a sincere way, and then listening to the answer can have a revolutionary impact on the entire system. If you, if you are able to simultaneously have the support from the top, 
the, the factors like psychological safety, compassionate communications, and other factors like that can be implemented from the top down as well. But we, we shouldn't ignore the power of, um, of, of the everyday actions. Fascinating and powerful. Just looking at some of the comments that are coming through uh, in the chat box and, and also in the Q&A, one strand that seems to be coming through very clearly is how you instill or catalyze compassionate leadership in an organization that is not quite ready for it, or at least doesn't appear ready for it. How would you catalyze uh, a compassion revolution in those types of organizations? <laughs> well, I, uh, may I speak first, Laura and Evan? I'm sorry. Yeah. I should just defer to you. Would you like to start? No, oh, please. <laughs> I spend my life talking about this, so I can barely hold myself back. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the most common question we hear. <laughs> Um, I, w I can't wait to hear what you have to say. So let me be really brief and say that um, this idea that compassionate change is hard is true. And the idea that it's easy is also true. And we have to, again, hold both things together. So if your organization really, really, really cares about care quality and you're measuring that to death, then talk about care quality and use the work that infuses how to think about compassion to talk about care quality. If you're really, really, really focused on growth right now, right, you're measuring the heck out of growth, right? One thing I know about our systems is that they measure everything to death, right? Look at what your organization is measuring and then talk compassion language to that measure, right? This is not different from anything else you're trying to do in your organization. And I saw someone in the, in the chat, which I can't quite read simultaneously with the conversation, but I did see someone saying, we need translation here. And I said, absolutely, yes. And you are the translators. And that's why we're having a meeting like this, right? So take the ethos of this, take the social architecture ideas that we've talked about in Awakening Compassion at Work and that are infused into the teachings of great um, people who are teaching leadership like Evan and Laura and translate it into the language of whatever your organization is measuring right now. It's possible and necessary. Mm. Thank you, Monica, please. And, and Monica has in her in her initial remarks have, has given the answer to what you do when you're in an organization where the people above you aren't ready. First, you look upward and you notice, notice what they're doing. Secondly, you interpret it generously. They're doing what they're doing for a reason. There is an organizational goal they are seeking and you need to interpret what they're doing generously. They're not doing it to be mean or to be a jerk. They are doing it because they think this is how they will reach their goal. Then begin to feel what they must be going through and recognize they have enormous pressure as well. Finally, you can act by offering them creative solutions that will allow better results, better outcomes in a more compassionate environment. And if you are able to effectively communicate those things without blaming, without shaming, without challenging them as, as a poor leader, everyone would love to be more compassionate and have better outcomes at the same time. And that's what you can have. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I'd like to turn our attention even beyond health, uh, if I may. So often, we're talking about compassion and global health in the midst of huge levels of suffering that emerge from different issues. Taking an example, food insecurity in the most difficult places on the planet. What's the role of compassionate leadership in global health to bring this indivisibility between the sustainable development goals, all the different 
sustainable de development goals that look at all aspects of development. Would you like to make any comments on that? Um, and maybe we could start with Laura and Evan first and then go to Monica. Sure. Well, you want to... You... No, go ahead. In the three circles that Laura described, the outer circle is our shared common humanity. We have a tendency and a desire to isolate and separate ourselves from the suffering of others all over the world. And the sustainable development goals are there to help address it on a universal basis, which we all should embrace and should celebrate. And so I think that compassionate leadership helps us to be willing to be, to be aware, to notice the suffering that truly does exist on a global basis and then seek to relieve it. Beautifully stated. Um, Laura, would you like to add or shall we come to Monica? Go ahead. Monica. I want to share a few words from a poem by the poet Naomi Shahid Nye. I think this is a poem that many people know. It's called Kindness, but I want you to just substitute the word compassion here. Um, the lines are, before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know the sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. And that's when we start to speak to being with suffering, then we start to be with all kinds of suffering. And as Evan so beautifully said, we can try to build all kinds of walls. And because we're in dialogue with suffering and it's scary um, and it reveals our own weakness and fragility and mortality, we will build those kind of walls. And part of compassion toward ourselves is to say, I'm scared by this. I'm overwhelmed by this. It's too much. It's too much for me as one. So I see the size of the class and I need other people. I need a community. We need to be held in love together to do this hard, hard, beautiful, sometimes easy work together. Mm. Thank you, Monica. Beautiful. Now we're coming up to the end of this particular part of the Global Health Compassion Round, but I'd like to just, um, have one final thought from colleagues on the inner work of compassion cultivation and the outer work of organizational transformation. Now, both uh, initial remarks and all of the different pieces that you've mentioned since then really point to that. What are the big highlights that you want colleagues to take away related to the inner work of compassion cultivation and the outer work of organizational transformation. Um, can we start with Monica this time and then come to Laura and Evan? Um, I think this pattern is to start with the technical and then go to the beautiful. So I love this. <laughs> um, uh, if Heather shares those slides that we were working with today and you look at that process diagram that I was, I was using, and um, if you look at the couple of, uh, I put some questions around the edges of the diagram. And the way that you, you, you can use this diagram and what is embedded in it in many different ways, but one way that I use it often is that I use it as a way to look outward and understand how can I awaken more compassion in the organization around me by looking for what, how this process is working. And there will inevitably come a moment where I have to turn it inward and look at how am I noticing my own pain and suffering how am I interpreting that as relevant or not relevant to what the work is that I'm doing right now? 
And as I interpret that suffering more generously, how can I feel more concerned for my own well being, which moves me to act to take deep care of myself and to move myself back into the space where I can look outward and do that outer work? Hmm. Thank you, Monica. Laura, Evan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this requires the desire and the, I, I, I'm actually going to say the discipline to, to notice, to pay attention, to practice, to move where we have been and focus on where we want the attention and the energy to flow. That takes practice. It takes personal practice. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't hope happen over a year or decades. It takes every moment of every day to pay attention so that we can move into these desired states. And it also means that we move this inner work of practice and attention into an organizational setting so that we become communities and organizations of practice. Just like Monica said, we must support each other. Practice does not work alone. <laughs> it works a little bit and then you really need the community and the organization and the energy and the intention of everyone to, to get us all to flourish which is where we want to be and to love. Thank you, Laura. I know we're coming up to the end of this particular part, but I know that we have a key takeaway message slide uh, that we would like to just go through. So we just have that slide and, and perhaps Monica, you'd like to speak to that as we wrap up and hand back to David. I think the key I would leave you with is that if you're here today, you're right where you need to be. And you, um, allow this conversation to awaken in you a sense mm -hmm. of caring about your fellow beings as an ennobling stance. And then allow that to let you reach out to others and um, rest in their help. Right, so that the work is inside out, but it's also outside in. And sometimes we don't learn really how to be compassionate leaders until we experience a community of other fellow travelers. And then that moves us into the inner work. So wherever you're standing today, um, be embraced by this beautiful community and make the best use of it that you possibly can. Mm. Thank you very much, Monica. We've got the, some of the key takeaways from this just here. Um, Laura, would you like to speak to any of these points before we hand back to David? Um, I'll, I'll let Evan close up, thank so you. I will, I think all five of these takeaways are tremendous, but. I would, like to, I would like to leave us with the final one. Leaders are everywhere. Leadership is about motivating others towards a shared goal. And global health has a clearly defined goal of relieving suffering and, and helping remove the causes of suffering. We can all contribute to moving towards that goal. We don't have to be at the top of organizations. We can do it by noticing what can be changed, by noticing what other people need. It is, it is all about our relationships and we can take advantage of that each and every place we go. And the higher you are in the organization, the greater the opportunity and the greater the responsibility you have to be uh, taking that focus that, that Laura spoke of, that intention to lead compassionately. Wonderful. Evan, Laura, Monica, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, let's get back to David and the remainder of the Global Health Compassion Rounds. David. Thank you. 
Thank you, Shams, and thank you all. What a powerful um, session. Um, yeah, there's a, so much there to uh, absorb and, and just live with and just so deeply appreciate your sharing your, your energy and enthusiasm with us. The next part of our time together, we'll be hearing from two global health yeah. leaders. Water. And the, uh, the, they come from very different sections of the healthcare system. First, we'll hear from Manver, Manvir Victor, who's chair of Patients for Patient Safety based in Malaysia. And his, it was his own extensive experience as a patient in the medical system and really the experience of his own suffering within that system that motivated him to become a patient advocate. He sits on many global advisory boards and advocates for uh, healthcare providers to listen deeply to their patients and incorporate their perspectives into healthcare organizations. So uh, Mr. Victor sits at the level of the, um, the healthcare provider and the patient interaction and speaks to us from his own experience. Because he's based in Malaysia, uh, we've recorded his remarks so that we can hear them. Uh, the, the volume might be a little bit low, so you may want to turn up your volume. And after we hear from Mr. Victor, we will I'll introduce our other uh, speaker um, uh, who will join us uh, live. Thank you. I had gone to the hospital because I was not feeling well. And after a series of tests, a doctor had sent me over to a nephrologist. And uh, he had a quick look at my results and he just very matter of factly, no preamble to anything. He just turned around and said, Oh, Manbir, your creatinine is very high. You have to be on dialysis. There's a machine over there. You have to start with that on Monday. And needless to say, I was in total shock. He gets up and says, uh, okay, uh, my nurse will take care of you. And then he got up and he left. I went downstairs and I called another friend of mine who was a doctor. And I said, this guy just told me this. There's no explanation. And he got up and he left to go and see somebody else. Uh, I have no idea what to do. And so my friend, the doctor, he sent me to another doctor in another hospital. And this guy was the total opposite of the first doctor that I saw. This second doctor sat down and he explained to me point by point what was happening in my body, why this possibly happened, and what are the next causes of treatment. And so there's this fast difference between the first doctor and the second doctor. And I am thankful for him because both of them went to a, a university, both of them were experienced, both of them knew what they were doing, except for one doctor had compassion and the other had none. That, that second doctor and that third doctor really is the reason I do what I do right now. I try to make every single person that I meet remember that that's the way you're supposed to be a doctor. I think what we are trying to do with our organization is continuously approach people from a human point of view and just listen to the patient. The humanity and the story is rather important for us to tell the stories of real people having real situations and, and real suffering, if, if there was, or real parts of joy. And I think that, that is the important thing. After my transplant, I had, I had to go in and see my doctors every day uh, for that, you know, for that first one month. And so I'd go there and, and I'd see the doctors and after a couple of days, I, I, I'd get to know them, right? And so I'd, I'd, I'd come in there and ask them first, have you had your breakfast? Have you had your lunch? And if, 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 I, if I hear that two days in a row that they haven't had their lunch or something, I'd buy them some donuts or something like that and I'd bring it over and you know, I'd just give it to them because I think you should, you should take a break. Just take a 10 minute break and ha have a cup of coffee or have something because they're in the public service here, they're so busy. 
and it, they're, they're just so busy. So many of us patients were there. Everyone had a chronic issue. So just to humanize them, and then they realize that oh, uh, we, we're treating them differently. So they start to treat us differently. So we've got to do that. If I went in there and I started shouting at my doctor, the doctor would be defensive. The doctor will start passing me around, say, this patient is a difficult guy, let's not deal with him. Uh, that, so we are trying to just build them as, as friends so that they, are, they take a personal interest in us. The important thing is going to them when they're young which is in the university. So we were, we had a series where on a yearly basis, we would be talking at uh, three or four of the medical universities here to fourth year students or fifth year students before they started uh, their housemanship. And we were talking to them and bringing to their attention why they chose to become a doctor in the first place. And we're just telling the stories of human, human stories uh, to understand that this patient is not just data, it's just not medication, it's just not stuff that you put in here, into him. So there's a reaction to this whole thing. So we bring the human aspect in our story and we start telling that. So each one of us that when we tell our story, we tell them who we are, where we went and studied. Uh, what our lives are like before we fell ill and when we fell ill and now. So we tell them this so that they realize that we are just one of those people that they will meet on a daily basis. Oh, we've, we've, had, we've had a lot of hospital directors, uh, people who are running hospitals who don't believe that the patients have got anything to offer. They come from a very old school of thought because, listen, I went to med school for seven years and I've been a doctor for 30 years. I've seen them all. Uh, all of you have one duty. That's just to absolutely trust me, the doctor. Do not question me. Do not ask me anything else. I'm just giving you this. Take it and leave. So we share the example of that second doctor, that third doctor that I was talking about earlier. And those shining examples, because when, when younger doctors hear that, they say, I want to be like that. I don't want to be old and jaded and hate patients. Nobody wants to do that. No, no one who comes out of university wants to do that. It's just a situation and an environment that they are in, where they are taught, where they are learning, uh, whichever hospital that they are at, they begin to hone that kind of attitude. So we just want to keep reminding them that, hey, let's be like the good doctor. I don't think everyone wants to be a doctor like House in, in their TV program. You know, he's brilliant, but sarcastic. Nobody wants to be like that. Everyone wants to be a great doctor. And, you know, have empathy and all that. But it, this is not a TV show. It doesn't end in an hour. It, this is the entire day. And if we can help a few of them, just to infuse uh, their own group of peers, it would be a great thing. I would love for the WHO or some organization right at the top there to, to, to release a statement in a decree and say to every single hospital in the world that they must have patient groups. So if you want to build a hospital, this is your KPI. It's not 250 beds. It's not plumbing. It's not only that. It needs to be patient. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor. That was really inspiring. And uh, Shams, you, you have your charge from... Uh, Manvir for uh, what he would like to see. So we'll look forward to you following up on that. Next, it's my really great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zerahun Tadesi. He's the country representative of the uh, Carter Center in Ethiopia. Dr. Tadesi has degrees in medicine and public health 
and three decades of experience in patient care, public health management, and leadership. Much of his work involves neglected tropical diseases, which are causes of immense physical and emotional and social suffering. Dr. Zarahun participated in the first cohort of the Compassionate Leadership course offered by uh, Laura and Evan. And he, I can tell you from my personal meeting him a few years ago in Ethiopia, he thinks very deeply about compassion and what it means for public health leadership. So we've heard from the patient perspective. Now we'll hear from Dr. Uh, Zarahun on the public health organizational perspective. And uh, Zarahun, just welcome. We're so uh, delighted to, to have you here today. My pleasure to be part of the panel. Yeah, great. Maybe I might start. Uh, we've heard from the panelists earlier that compassionate um, leadership sometimes is very difficult. And I noticed in one of the uh, comments in the chat was that uh, we often associate strong leadership with the absence of compassion. Now you've embarked on this journey of compassionate leadership. And uh, what is it that motivates you to do that? What is it that's inspiring you on a path of compassionate leadership? Uh, thank you for uh, this great question. Uh, the number one uh, factor that motivated me is I really love my job. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, I want to enjoy it for many more years. Uh, and I have come to learn that uh, much of my success uh, uh, for many years depended entirely uh, on working harder rather than smarter. Uh, and uh, and I came uh, to learn that you can only work harder uh, so much. You cannot keep on working harder and harder because there is always a limit to how much you can work hard and to how much you can uh, exceed. But when it comes to working smarter, I don't think uh, that is the case. Even the sky may not be the limit uh, as long as you keep on sharpening as, as long as you continue working smarter. So I found compassionate leadership as a gateway to uh, working smarter, uh, as a gateway to excel, and as a gateway uh, to maintain uh, uh, my interest. Otherwise, if I work harder and harder, the risk of burnout would be very high. Uh, and there is no way for me uh, to give compassion to others when I'm not uh, taking care of uh, myself. So that is number one. Uh, motivation. Uh, the second one is uh, I want to belong among the modern leaders. Uh, unlike before where the best leaders are known to be like uh, dictators, uh, my way or the highway and so on, that is no more the case. So I want uh, to get divorced from that uh, category, even if I'm from the earlier uh, generation, but I want to really belong to uh, the modern uh, leaders. So uh, the uh, best way would be to be a compassionate uh, leader. And uh, the third uh, uh, motivation is uh, I would like to uh, maintain my followers uh, and even add more. Because if you don't have followers, you are no more a leader. You are no more a leader. So uh, I want to maintain them. And one interesting finding I uh, found discussing with one of my coworkers was uh, he, I, I, it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and he told me that the thing he appreciated most about me was uh, the fact that when uh, staff, when colleagues lose their loved ones, I always attend uh, to the funeral ceremonies, and that was consistent. I didn't know I was just doing it out of obligation, but he said he was impressed. Not only that, to many of the ceremonies, I go with my spouse, and uh, who is not a staff member of the organization, of course, but he was impressed. And this was like uh, something I was doing it out of ob obligation, but uh, you see little things make a lot of difference. So these are some of the motivating factors. Thank you so much. That's, those are great examples. And, and it shows how you're, you're being a human being as you're also being a leader uh, in, in that context. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, uh, in fact, it works very well if you first connect as human beings before you connect as co-workers, as uh, fellow colleagues. So that uh, tends to be my philosophy. Great. 
I wonder if you could share some of this, this you just gave an example of some successes of things that you've done um, uh, to exhibit and, and manifest compassionate leadership. If you have other examples of successes where you've been intentionally focused on compassionate leadership, and then maybe what challenges have you been, uh, exper have you experienced and maybe that you're ex experiencing now um, in, in um, really, uh, uh, continuing and manifesting compassionate leadership on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Thank you so much. Uh, one of uh, my approach is like uh, uh, leading by example. I usually uh, talk the walk. I will not only just talk the talk. So uh, I really uh, uh, do things uh, so that I uh, put a very good example to my colleagues, a simple example would be, I've already established what I call leadership growth and development team at the Carter Center, uh, where 30 high uh, level and mid level leaders uh, are part of. And we convene two to three days meeting every six months or so, uh, when uh, we, uh, I really uh, set the stepping stone for compassionate leadership. And we also have some time to retreat, to connect at personal level and so on. This is one typical example. Another one is every uh, six or eight months, uh, I have already started to have one-on-one -on -one with my colleagues where I discuss on so many subjects, my strengths, their strengths, and so on. So this really uh, opens the forum for a communication which is from heart to heart because mm -hmm. compassionate leadership is not something that comes from the head. It is something that comes from the heart. So I've, uh, I'm already doing a lot on this regard. And Probably one more point is uh, I am known among so many things by being a very good listener. Maybe my background in psychiatry has also helped me. So uh, I, I, I listen not only with my ears, with all my senses, because when I dedicate time for somebody, it is a real dedication. I don't do multitasking and so on and so forth. And that really loud uh, speaks loud and clear uh, how compassionate I am when I sit with my uh, colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll need to return to the panel and we ask you to join us for that, uh, the, the panel and for conversations and questions. But I wondered if there's any additional points you'd like to add on the theme of compassionate leadership, uh, maybe in reaction to what you've heard uh, in the first part of our time together today. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, only a few more uh, points, one, uh, when we want to take departure to uh, compassionate leadership, I think it should start in out. The most important challenge is uh, the challenge that comes from ourselves, because we are afraid that we might be looked as weak leadership if we are compassionate. Uh, one and the other one is other some probably underperforming or malingering uh, colleagues may uh, overutilize it or abuse it and so on. So it shouldn't be all or none, but there should be a mechanism to address those uh, unfavorable side effects and so on. So if we, it's not like something to, uh, to be afraid of, or it's not something to do it overnight. It is a process. Uh, and since compassionate leadership comes from the heart, and as we know, heart is a muscular system, we have to exercise on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, that, these are the points I'd like to add at the end. Thank you so much, Zerahun. Again, it's it's such a pleasure to have you here. And, and please, if you can stay around while uh, Shams uh, uh, convenes uh, a little op uh, discussion among the panelists and tries to, we try to address some of the questions in the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Shams. Very much, David. And um... Zerahun, really wonderful to have that perspective and also the perspective from Manvir. We're just now going into the final round of um, discussion because there's been so much that's already been said that can hopefully stimulate some of the, the thinking now. Um, one point that keeps on recurring is the conflict between having time and being compassionate. It's a tough one. So this is the time for that question on time. 
And if we could go, yes, Laura, I please. Let's start with you, then Monica and Sarah. Sure. And it is, it is one of these um, favorite questions that I think come up because we feel like it, it's, it's too much. And I will bring us back to the idea that we can turn our attention to, and be curious about what we're noticing or whether we're present. As Sarah Hoon said, are we listening? We're already being human. We're just doing it without sort of weaving back to our compassionate nature. And I think it's really about opening up our curtain of awareness so that we're paying attention with a compassionate lens so we can act and be more compassionate as we're just going about what we're doing. Thank you, Laura. Monica? My answer is very similar. I think um, I sometimes say it this way in a context where the organization is so loaded with demands, which I know that I, I at least listen to the stories of the load from the work of people like the ones who are listening to us today. Um, here's a little mantra that I use that might be helpful to you. Uh, you're going to take that breath anyway, so you might mm -hmm. want to take it with some mindful compassion. And you're going to have that conversation anyway. You might want to do it with some mindful compassion. You're going to review those employees. You're going to look at that process and revamp it so that it's more efficient. As you do that, you need to do that with an eye toward also making it more compassionate, right? But if you just start with that breath, right? We're gonna take that breath anyway. We can take it with a little bit more compassion. Thank you, Monica. Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, I would uh, like to underline the fact that uh, what is the value of love? What is the value of uh, the, how much worth is uh, healthy relationship in a work environment? So if you try uh, to quantify that, and I, I think the return on investment is so many fold. So it is worth taking some time of everyone's busy schedule and invest on this, number one. Number two, uh, people I think have to shift from managing time to managing their energy. If people start to manage their energy, it means they start with something that motivates them. So they can get things done in a couple of hours rather than spending the whole day and the night. So that is my, my advice to my colleagues. Mm. Fantastic. Darren, there's a specific question to you that's come through from Paul Emerson. Um, you put so much time, effort, and energy into being a compassionate leader. What do you get back for your investment? <laughs> Thank you so much, my, my friend Paul, for asking this. Uh, uh, the, the, the return is immense because when I invest a lot of my time, sometimes extra time, on my colleagues, I assure you, they take care of the projects and then the projects take care of themselves. So at the end of the day, I empower my colleagues and I have time to relax and, and so on. So the return is immense. It is win, win, win for me, for my colleagues and for my organization. Very good. Jams, can I just say that yes, as, as is so often the case, the social science research is just the exclamation point on the end of the human story. <laughs> and the research reinforces this as well, that people who enact compassionate leadership feel immense returns in getting to be a, the more of the leader they want to be. And as they feel better as enacting the leader they want to be, the people around them actually do 
higher quality, more productive work. So there, the research is the exclamation point on Jarahoon's beautiful story that um, it's a win, 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 win spiral. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Laura Evan, did you want to add to this? It's a really important question that's been posed. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. So I think what we're hearing, and it's so important, is that when you come into alignment with your deeper values, with what really matters in life, with your love, with your purpose, with why you're here, <laughs> that when all of that starts resonating, that becomes the spiral of win, 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 win. It's more than three wins. <laughs> and, and by the way, the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I and I, I just want to say that, and Monica expressed this earlier so clearly. We all have this compassion, and 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 uh, this innate ability, and and the trick is to awaken it. And when we awaken it, we are coming into that alignment. And so, compassion really isn't something to be learned. Compassion is something that's forgotten. So once we've forgotten, all we have to do is reawaken it. And remember. Remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and I Thank think you. the other Thank important you. thing we should add to this conversation because we can in an inadvertently feed David's right, need to save the world at the expense of oneself narrative here if we don't say that there, the compassionate leadership requires building a circle of trust where you can share your brokenness and you can say, I don't know what to do, right? There's something here that I don't know how to handle. And you bring your pain and suffering as a leader to others who hold you, help you, advise you, um, comfort you, right? And so it's not, compassionate leadership isn't about having all the answers and becoming the superhero. But often the most courageous part is saying, I have no idea what I'm doing and I feel lost and I really need some help. Thank you, Monica. Again, as usual, we um, are challenged by time, even within this Global Health Compassion Round. Um, I would like to uh, end with a question to each of the panelists related to this um, cascade effect and the fact that um, I think folks have already mentioned that the colleagues that are participating in these rounds are really the translators, they're the catalysts for change in their respective arenas of work. So all those compassion revolutionaries, what's the one takeaway that you'd give them um, to really take forward tomorrow or even the remainder of today for those who are in the US or, or in the different time zones? What's the one thing that you want them to take away, to take action immediately? Uh, Zerahun, I'm going to come to you first, then to Monica, and then to Laura and Evan. Uh, my uh, one important takeaway would be uh, that uh, compassionate leadership uh, is a function of commitment and conscious practice. You really need to be committed, and you have to consciously practice it, not in a haphazard way. That is how I'd like to put it. Clear and succinct, Sarah, and as always, thank you. Monica? Yes, I would like to say to the translators and the leaders and the people working to build more compassion in wherever you sit, in whatever leadership chair you're sitting in, that small moves matter. So the smallest of actions that you might think make no difference at all ripple in unexpected ways. And when you're feeling overwhelmed and challenged and despairing, I hope you can come back and come home to just that the smallest of moves matter. Spot on. Laura, Evan. I would like to build on what Monica said and what I would encourage you to use as a small move is awe. When we can recognize what an amazing gift we've been given in each breath, in each beat of our heart, 
it just lifts us up and makes us, it, it fuels our compassion. So look outside or look inside and recognize what an amazing existence we have. Where did this come from? I can only add, you know, this is the gift of being human. This is life. There's no separation. There's nothing other than this. And here we are. Let's embrace it. Laura, thank you so much. Colleagues, absolutely fascinating. So much more to unpack. The chat box is a crazy chat box. That, is, that chat box is a dissertation in its right. We're going to have to unpack it. We're going to have to start thinking about all of those points that have been made. Um, there's no way that I'm going to be able to summarize any of this, but we are going to get a report out to colleagues so that we can use this as uh, compassion revolutionaries. So with that, thank you again. And over to you, David, for um, bringing us all together. Thank you so much, Shams. And I would just say that in addition to the report, which you'll be receiving, uh, we'll also make the entire recording available and encourage you to view it again uh, and share it with your colleagues. Uh, Evan mentioned awe. I'm awestruck by the wisdom and energy of the participants here today. And I'm just deeply grateful for all of you for being with us and for entering this space together. Um, I thank you, Shams, Laura, Evan, Monica, Zerahun, um, uh, and, and Manvir, just uh, really, um, there's so much to, for us to reflect on and to contemplate on. It's very hard to summarize all of these themes that uh, have been raised, um, and I won't even try, but I think Laura summed it up, here we are. We're on a journey together, uh, exploring the deeply human interiority of our own compassion and our own being. And we're doing that in the context of global health, which is a massive effort to alleviate suffering. It's, it's, a, it's an effort that is rooted and grounded and fueled by compassion. So how do we bring this inner work together with the outer work of alleviating suffering on a global scale. That's our challenge. I thank you uh, panelists for really inspiring us and giving us some practical examples of how to move forward, the big steps, the little steps. I wanna thank the, all the team at the Focus Area for Compassion and Ethics behind the scenes that made it possible for us today. Heather Vistler, uh, Ashley Graham, our amazing interns, Sophie LaRuth, Emma Howard, Amy Richards, and also Gabriella Corrigan uh, for working with the video and, and making that available for us today. Thank you for your um, participation, for all the comments and chats. As Sham said, we will be um, going over these, sorting through them, taking them on board, and uh, bringing them back to you in the context of additional global health <laughs> compassion rounds. Thank you so much. <laughs>